Alright, Shabbat Shalom everyone. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Well, we are good to go, so blow the shofar and pray and we'll get into the Torah portion. really loud it down here <laughs> okay all right shalom shalom everyone so we are in this week's Torah portion um, we're starting at Genesis 47 at verse 28 and then we'll finish the rest of the book of Genesis to chapter 50 uh, 26 then we'll have the um, the Haftarah reading, and that'll be, I've got it on here, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and then John chapter 13, verses 1 through 19 for the Brit Hadashah reading. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just come to you in prayer in the glorious name of Yehovah Yeshua, Abba Shabbat Shalom. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful day, and we thank you for this time to be alone and set apart unto you. We thank you for all of what it means to have this time with you, Abba, to seek your presence, to be before your throne. And Abba, just ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your word and your truth, and Abba, that we would just be lost in your presence today, uh, that we would not be about our own things, doing our own things, saying our own things, whatever it may be, but that we would have this time, this day set apart in our thoughts and our discussions and everything that they be set apart unto you and to spend this time with you. We ask that you will fill us with your word as we get into it. As we read it and study it, Father, and today, uh, as Brother Daniel does the message this afternoon, Father, just ask that you would please speak through him and watch over him and just bless us all with the message, Father, that you would give him the words to speak and that it would be convicting for each one of us and encouraging and strengthening. And we just lift all of this up to you in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Bear with me, my allergy has been hitting me harder than usual this morning. Uh -oh. Man, well, my nose won't stop that that burny itch from uh, allergies. All right, damn me nuts. <laughs> okay. All right, Shalom, Gene and Larry, Treasure, BG Tower, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. All right, let's do this. Okay, so again, Genesis, we're in Genesis chapter 47, starting at verse 28. And this is the one, um, let's see. This one is, um. Uh, by he, by he, he lived. All right, Genesis 47, starting at verse 28. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, now, if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers, and you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. 
Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. He took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. Israel, and Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multiple multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as, after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died before, I'm sorry, beside me, in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrat. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, that is, Bethlehem. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom Yah has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them too. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I have not thought to see your face, but in fact Yah has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth, and Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand, and towards Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand, toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, Yah, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the El who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. <clears throat> Bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, so he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of... Where did I just totally lost my spot. Where did it go? become a multitude of nations. Wow, I totally lost that sentence. <laughs> Try that again. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May Yah make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but Yah will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my mighty, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable is water, you shall not excel. 
because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defile it, defiled it. He went up to my couch. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all. My allergies are just really hammering me this morning. <clears throat> Simeon and, Le and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. Wow, that's horrible. <laughs> For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to him shall be the obedience of the people binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships and his border shall adjoin Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Yehovah. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Bread from a share shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Joseph is a fruitful buff, a fruitful buff by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty El of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By, by the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their fathers spoke to them, and he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. 
the field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. Now when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hear." Uh, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying. In my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, Go up, bury your father, as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all of the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went, and there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father, and when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore its name was called Abel Mitzrayim, which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial place. After he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who went up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. <laughs> so they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for, I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but Yah meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Machir and the son of Manasseh were also brought up on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but Yah will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, Yah will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. You know, one thing that stands out about this is, as we read in last week's Torah portion, continued from it, everything that happened to Joseph, from his dreams to his brothers hating him, to them throwing him in the pit, to them betraying um, 
to selling him to the um, Ishmaelites and him being sold to Pharaoh to Egypt you know and right away even in that place so up to that point we all know any one of us having that happen to us I mean think about this for a second if any of you have siblings you got brothers um, even sisters whatever and for them to turn on you in such a way that they would throw you into a pit they would talk about actually killing you and then but one of the brothers stops that from happening and so they throw you in a pit there in the pit you're dying you're left there to die then you're pulled out sold to basically as a slave to uh, another culture and then you're taken to another land where you become a servant to a king of, a, of another land and this whole time and going through all of that there's not a one of us who wouldn't think that we were utterly cursed uh, hated by God even thinking Yah must hate me for all of this that's going on and th there's no telling what Joseph went through in all of this what was his thoughts as he laid there in the pit you know wondering how he ended up there probably talking to Yah and I'm not even going to pretend to have his mindset because today's modern day world mindset even in the Middle East doesn't even touch that ancient mindset so did he ask Yah what's going on I have these dreams you know you're, you're showing me that this is going to happen or something and then this happens you know you start you would think that somebody's going to question or wonder is this really from God and, and and have I done something wrong to mess it up and this is why everything's going wrong or whatever the case may be but we can't help but look and see that the fact is is that just like Job Job's purpose was to show a, an evidence of somebody being able to stay faithful to Yah no matter what Joseph the whole purpose behind him was to be a type of shadow of Yeshua and from being betrayed by your own Yeshua came and was rejected by his own people betrayed by his own people betrayed by his one of his own disciples you know Joseph's brothers all betrayed him um, and and the pattern of everything and then to find out that through this all as you're so you get to this country and all of a sudden you you start gaining some favor in the eyes of the one who's in charge the king there and 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 it finds out that you've you know got a lot of blessing and and an anointing and wisdom that Yah has given to you and you start finding favor and all of a sudden you're in a good position but you're still a slave to this person who you were sold to and so you're in this place and you're trying to figure this out and I can only imagine and that's the only word to use what Joseph went through in his mind unless Yah talked to him continually but to but as Joseph describes here what was meant for wickedness by his brothers because of their jealousy for him Yah allowed that to be turned into Yah's glory to become the most powerful man on earth even above Pharaoh even though Pharaoh said that you will be in charge of everything but you will answer only to me otherwise you're in charge of everything but in all honesty Yah made Joseph in charge of everything including Pharaoh because Pharaoh didn't do anything without the leading of Joseph Pharaoh uh, every recommendation that Joseph made Pharaoh did everything that Joseph said he wanted to do Pharaoh gave his blessing so in every manner of speaking Yah made Joseph a man who was in a pit to be king over the world all for the purpose of saving his people Israel 
from the seven years of great famine that had come upon the land, after seven years of bountiful plenty, to stock up and get ready and save up for the seven years of famine, all from the dreams that Joseph had uh, been given in his youth. And here's another thing, too, that I want to kind of touch on before we get into the, the Haftarah reading, is the mentality of religion today and the so-called body of Messiah, uh, especially in the church and even in a lot of messianic congregations, the mentality is that if God shows you something or says something to you, you're supposed to take off after because it's going to happen right away or shortly. But that is not the case, Mishpaha. It is almost never the case unless Yah says, go now, this needs to be done now. In which he shows that when that's time. But when his anointing and his hands on people for them to do a mighty work in Yah and things like that, for them to be called by Yah and things like that, um, then more often than not, that doesn't happen for 10, 20 years down the road. You have Joseph as an example. His dreams were much, uh, was in his youth as a young teenage boy, what he seemed to be, you know, when he's having these dreams of the, of the cattle and of the stalks of grain and, and them bound down to him and, you know, and then the, the cows, the good fat cows and the and the, the seven fat cows and the seven starving cows and you know, giving him the dream of of the the, the harvest plentiful and the and the um, um the the dryness and the drought that would come next for seven years. King David was anointed by Samuel as king 20 years before David became king. And all throughout the scriptures, we see a lot of things like that. But every time I see people get something or get receive, and I, I had to learn too, I, you know, early in my walk. And, and you know, um, a good example is when my wife and I first came to keeping all of the word of Yah about 15, 16 years ago when we started keeping Torah. Or I'd like to better say it the way scripture talks about is when we started having the testimony of Yeshua and keeping the commandments. Uh, one of the first things in the first couple years of our walk, Yah showed us. My wife and I believe very strongly that Yah showed us that he has a place for us in Israel and that he has work for us there. And of course, in, young in that walk and on fire with all this new knowledge of the truth, I'm thinking, hey, we're supposed to do this right away, right? And so, you know, in 09, we moved, sold everything and moved over there. And we got to be there for a minute and enjoyed it and and um, got to experience what so many have not been able to do. And that is to be in the land and to have the Bible come to life. But it wasn't time yet. And Yah brought us back. A couple years later, um, Yah blessed us with SY7 ministry to start. And we've had that ever since. And... Over the years, over the next 10 years, um, in that, you know, growing, learning, um, being refined, being purified, doing all these things, Yah cleaning us out, getting us ready. And in 2019, we moved back to Israel. Um, we would still be over there if we hadn't come back for a visit the beginning of 2020 in March, right before COVID hit and we got stuck. But everything happens for a reason. Whether we understand it or not, doesn't matter. But what we can look at is since being through this situation with COVID shutting the world down and everybody being stuck in their own country for a few years, it was a time of greater purifying. 
And it's been a time of Yah showing his children, his true saints, that it's, it's time to get ready to come home, so to speak. Not to be taken up to heaven, but to come home to him because he is going to come and rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. It's time for us to get more prepared and more ready for his return because we are entering into these last days at such a high rate of speed, uh, more so in these last couple of years than we've ever seen and the things that are piling up and each year since this COVID's hit, we're seeing things getting worse and worse every year. And so now for us, as we haven't made it a, a big public announcement yet, but now that all the shots and vaccines and all that stuff has been put to a halt because we won't touch it, um, now we can go back. We can get back to Israel and Italy and we're heading back here in a couple months. Um, we have others in the ministry that are heading over to Jerusalem uh, this summer. Um, and our elder Robert, he's heading over to the Philistines, Philistines, the Philippines. And, um, you know, he's going to be in doing ministry there. So Yah is taking his people. And then we have, a, and then we have James and um, Daniel and Alicia who will be running the, ministry, the congregation here in America, in Colorado. And this is what Yah does with his people. And so my purpose in saying all this, Ms. Baha, is if in your walk and wherever you're at right now, if, you're, if you have this fire and desire and a hunger to be somewhere and it's stirring in your spirit and you, you have a hunger to move somewhere else in the United States or maybe you're in another country watching this, wherever you're at, and you feel a drawing to Israel or... Macedonia, you know, I, I feel a, a desire to go into that place as well to go and and teach the word because in the last couple of years Macedonia just had two hundred and I've seen twenty five thousand or two hundred and seventy five thousand Bibles made in their language first time ever apparently so that's what the article said. And it's like, okay, God's doing things in different places. He's reaching his the people around the world that maybe have not had his word as of yet totally. And this is what's going on. If our life is his, if your life is his, Mishpaha, then where you're sitting is not likely to be unless that's where he has work for you. But what are you doing? Are you actively seeking it? Are you going to, are you just sitting still being content with where you're at, hoping to just hang out until things finish? If that's the case, that's the wrong idea. Yah has a purpose for every single one of us. He has a calling for each one of us to be a part of our job, to do our duty as, as the bride of Messiah. There's no spot that's too small. There's no Oh, well, this little thing, this ain't nothing. It's unimportant. If Yah gives this to you, that makes it important. More important than anything in the world. Yah does not give unimportant things. Yah does not give things that don't really mean anything. If he has given you a place to be a minister, to preach the word, to teach, to share, to witness, if he has given this to you, then you need to seek after it with all of your heart, knowing that this is this is the most invaluable, most priceless thing that he could give you to do for him, is to go about his work, to be a servant unto him, to, to go and do the will of the Father, and to be a part of that. Ms. Baha, I encourage you, time is running out. And those who truly belong to Yah, He is raising the saints up. He is raising up a people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. That means who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep His commandments. Anything less than that will fall away. Because when you reject a part of the truth, 
that will cause the greatest problems in your walk and you will never have a strong walk and eventually your walk will fall away because Yah's not going to let you stay in a half truth do not be foolish do not think that Yah is going to leave you in a place where oh this is okay this will be enough you have all of it or you have none of it satan will eat you alive if you do not walk in all of it that means having Yeshua and walking in obedience to his commandments. You have to have both to make it, Mishpaha. The word says so. So with that, we'll continue on. All right, so um, I just had a brain pause here. What chapter? Right, First Kings 2. First Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Keep the charge of Yehovah your Elohim to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the Torah of Moshe, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. It's like I just said. You cannot have all of what Yah has. You cannot have eternity if you think that you can stand and go, I believe in Messiah, but I don't have to keep the Sabbath. I don't have to keep the commandments. I don't have to keep the feasts. That was for the Jews or whatever lame excuse that you've been taught and has been ingrained in you. Mishpaha, we will not enter heaven without all of the truth of the word of Yah. There's no partial entry. You don't get in on a probationary period because you didn't get it all. If you don't, now don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about people who received salvation by repentance and then died a couple minutes later or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about for those of us who Yah has opened up his word to your eyes and to your heart, you are watching this, you have watched and read the word of God and all of these things, then you have no excuse. As scripture teaches, what we know, we will be held. Even what we don't know, we will still receive a couple stripes. But the word of Yah shows us exactly how to walk. And if you read, there's a difference between not knowing at all, literally being ignorant to something, and not ignorant, not in a bad word, but just not knowing. There's a difference between that and somebody coming up to you, showing you in the scripture, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath, and you say, I don't need to do that, and you reject it. If you think you can do that and still make it to heaven, then Satan has you full. Donna, good at I'm not I'm not Daniel, Donna. I'm Paul. <laughs> He's a whole lot taller. Um but anyways, let's continue. As David is saying here, verse 4. So we're, so do all of this, keep all of this, that you may prosper wherever you turn. And verse 4, that Yehovah may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you know also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jeder, whom he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist and on his sandals that were on his feet. Therefore, do according to your wisdom, do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace, but show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them 
be among those who eat at your table, for so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. And see, you have with you Shammai, the son of Gera, a Benjamite from Baharim, who cursed me with malicious curse in the day when I met, when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by Jehovah, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man, and know what you ought to do to him. But bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. So David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The period that David reigned over Israel was 40 years Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty-three years. Then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. You know, we also can get out of this too, as David talks about those who did wicked, wickedly to David's kingdom. It gives us, it gives, it shows us two things. One is what happens when you come against Yah's anointed. This is why David wouldn't touch Saul. You know, I've heard so many people say, why didn't David just kill him? Yah would have blessed him for it. Why didn't David just uh, have him arrested and take him out and all that stuff, you know? But David was wise. Because no matter how wicked anybody is, if you know, if you know that Yah's anointing is on somebody, no matter what has happened to them, it is not for us to touch him. And this is why Yah says, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. It's not our job to go after those who have done wickedly against us or anything else that way. Our job is to go after them in prayer, to go after them in the name of Yeshua, to go after them through Yah, and to let Him deal with them. And that's exactly what He did. David showed Saul a couple times how easily he could have taken him out. And it humbled Saul, but because of the demonic torment that he was in, it didn't last long, and Saul would always try to rise up again and do something. But David took, or Yah took care of it, and Saul died a horrible death because of his wickedness and his unwillingness to walk in obedience to Yah. All right, so... John chapter 13, verses 1 through 19. John 13, 1 through 19. Now before the feast of Pesach, when Yeshua knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil have, having already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from the Father and was going to the Father, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. <sighs> After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Yeshua answered and said to him, What I am doing, you, don't, you do not even understand now, or you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Yeshua, you know, one thing I like to say about Peter, it's encouraging, it really should be, because Peter 
made a lot of declarations without thinking first about what he was saying. Peter was quick to, oh, you'll never do this, or I'll never allow anything to happen to you, or I'll never betray you, I'll never, I'll, I'll never, never, you'll never, never, and all this other never. And every time Yeshua kept having to correct him, you know, he says, well, actually, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he goes, well, actually, if I don't do this, and like he says here, Yeshua says, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And then, of course, that made Peter, <laughs> he's like, well, Adon, then now my feet only, my hands and my head. He's like, okay, go ahead, take care of it, and here, let's do this too. Do my hands on my head, and Yeshua's like, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Mishpaha, this is something that not enough of this is remembered and lived by, especially by those who are, are leaders of ministries, congregations, leaders of, of whatever kind, street ministry. You're leading people in the Word of Yah. You're going around teaching people the Word of God. And the problem is, is too many tend to think that they're above everybody else and that they're better than everybody else. But Yeshua says, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. You know, in what Yeshua is talking about here as well, and what he did, and what he's saying about you are you are a servant is not greater than his master. We're all supposed to be Yeshua's servant, and he is our master. He is our king. He is our our Ishi, our husband. Well, will be when we redo the wedding vows, as it were. But what he shows here is that as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and so many of the religious leaders today, they all act like they're better than all the other servants. They all act like they're above everybody else. And the thing of it is, is Yeshua never acted like he was a righteous leader. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't go around with a fancy mantle and religious garb and and looking the part as it were and 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 going around so that everybody can oh this almighty man of god you know son of god and holy holiness of god and all this he did not go around presenting himself to be that way so that people could look at him that way but yet, how many do we see around us doing exactly that? They wear all the fancy garments. They try to look like they're a holy man or a holy woman. They call themselves, they title themselves to be the prophet so-and-so or the apostle so-and-so. Or I mean, uh, they, they take these titles, uh, rabbi also, and, and they claim these titles to be of them and that they have the right to be this. But to do so makes them look like, they're making them look like they're a higher authority than the master. 
We're supposed to be the imitation of Yeshua, not be the imitation of King Yeshua. We're supposed to be the imitation of the servant Yeshua, the one who came to die for our sins. He said, I didn't come to rule. I didn't come to be king. I came to serve. I came to pay the price. When he comes back to be king, then we who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments will rule and reign with Yeshua. Then we will wear those garments. Then we will be seen as mighty above all other men because we will be will be transformed to our 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 perfect bodies are from mortal to immortal from corruptible to incorruptible will be transformed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye and so then we will rule and reign and then those in the flesh upon the earth that we will rule and reign over then we will be an authority then they will look at us that way because Yeshua will put us in that position but the position that he's put you in now is to serve you are to be a servant to all of those around you you're not to pump yourself up and lift yourself up and make yourself look better than them you're to lift them up encourage them exalt them that's what we're supposed to do if you truly are a servant of Yah, if you truly are uh, blessed by Yah, then Yah will exalt you through his children. Yah, Yah will lift you up and exalt you. And we don't need to do that for ourselves. Ms. Baha, stop making this walk about you. It's not about you. It's never been about you. What Yeshua did was about you dying on the cross for you that was about you so he could save you now it's about him and everything you do is to be about him not about you but about him so that others can know who he is so that others can have the same chance the same blessing the same opportunity to receive an eternal gift that we would never even know about if he didn't reveal it to us first. So go and wash the feet of not only those who you know betray you, but of your brethren. Be lowly and meek, for the meek shall inherit the earth. That's a huge gift to be meek. You get the earth, so to speak. But the prideful, the haughty, the arrogant, the pompous and hubris, you don't get any of these things. You won't receive anything. You already have your reward. So Mishpaha, as he lived, may we live in him. Amen. All right. So that's today's Torah portion. Uh, it's uh, what time is it? It's 11 o'clock basically, so Daniel will be on live in two and a half hours with today's Shabbat message. And uh, um, I thought there was one more thing I was going to say. I think that's it. So we love y'all, Mishpaha, but most of all, y'all loves you. Have a blessed and restful Shabbat. Shalom, shalom.